ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 MIPS Performance Webinar. Thank you um, for your patience and understanding as we had to unexpectedly switch webinar platforms, and I'm really glad that you were all able to make it here today. The full recording with the description will be available next week on the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network YouTube channel. Your host and speaker for today is Mona Matthews. Mona, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lydia. Hello, everyone. This is mentioned, my name is Mona Matthews. I'm a project specialist with Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, serving Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the for Medic and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. I would like to welcome all of you to this session of the webinar um, and office hours. Today's call is operated assisted. By default, everyone's phones are currently muted to avoid some background noise. There will be an opportunity to ask questions over the phone, at which time Lydia will provide instructions. We will also be closely monitoring the chat box and encourage you to post questions and comments throughout. Advance my, there we go. Also, please note that the information provided during this session is based on the latest information made available by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and is subject to change. CMS policies do change, as we all know, so we encourage you to review the specific statutes and regulations that may apply to you for interpretation and updates. At the conclusion of this, this webinar today, you'll have an opportunity to complete a brief evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback about this event. We'd also like you to, to remind you that if you receive direct technical assistance related to the QPP, to please take time to complete the evaluation sent at the conclusion of each technical assistance encounter. Your feedback really is very important to us. Lastly, I want to mention that during this webinar today, we can typically address a broad range of questions which are based on an equally broad range of QPP MIPS knowledge level of our, of our call participants. Some questions we will be able to answer quickly. Others may require some additional time to research due to the complexity of the question, while others may be scenario-based to your organization. Questions that our team deems broadly applicable to all of our audience will be emailed to the participants within a week of this event. Those that are scenario specific, our team will address directly with those attendees. At this time, I'll get going with our objectives. So today I wanted to just provide a quality payment program, kind of the what's happening with the technical assistance for the QPP, because there are some changes that we want to make you aware of. So, and then we'll under, I hope at the end you'll understand how to access your 2018 performance feedback results. I don't do a good job at the uh, by the end of the slide presentation today. Please ask questions about how to access those reports. We'll review how, what makes up your MIPS categories and how to understand how each of those impact your final score. And we should have plenty of time for questions and answers today. Let's start with some some important announcements. First of all, it's important for us to let you know that CMS has contracted with GuideHouse to conduct data validation and audits of a, selected, a select number of merit-based incentive payment system or MIPS eligible clinicians. They, people are being notified of these audits. If you are selected for a data validation and or audit, you're going to receive a request for information from a company called GuideHouse. Please don't ignore that. You do have 45 calendar days to respond. So there are some updates with, in regards to the technical assistance. As many of you know, uh, Lake Superior has been providing technical assistance to your organizations for, for the past couple of years. After July 17th, 
next week, the QPP Service Center will serve as the primary point of contact to help address QPP questions and concerns. Also want to point you to the QPP Resource Library, which continues to be a great centralized location for resources, information, and announcements. This will be the last Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network um, QPP webinar. The past recordings will continue to be available on the Lake Superior YouTube channel, which is linked in this slide. And then the Lake Superior um, Quinn website will, will also remain available if that is a resource that you, you want to use. Additional technical assistance information, just as a reminder, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, they will continue to provide assistance to small practices. And as a reminder, that's the practices with 15 and fewer clinicians until at least February 15, 2020. If you're not sure if you're a small or large practice, um, you can look that up on the Quality Payment Program website, qpp.cms.gov, and it will tell you if you're considered a small practice. But feel free to reach out to us if you need assistance finding that information. The other thing that I want to remind people of, and many of you have probably done this, it's been available since the beginning of this program, but if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to the QPP updates. So you'll, you'll navigate to the QPP website, scroll to the, the page, and you'll see a dialog box similar to what I have depicted on this screen. You will enter your email and then just click subscribe. So do not hesitate to reach out to us if you need assistance with subscribing to updates. And for those of you in Wisconsin and Michigan, I know Tisha has been sending information out pretty much on a weekly basis for the Michigan folks. And in Wisconsin, I have been sending out kind of that QPP announcement each Monday morning. This next Monday will be the last one of those that go, go out. Much of the information I have provided in those announcements comes right from these um, QPP updates. So don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so. Just a little bit about what, what's going on with the Medicare Quinn QI, QIO program for 2019 and to 2024. For these years, CMS has outlined these five broad priorities for the Quality Innovation Network and Quality Improvement Organization program. And those, those five priorities are improving behavioral health outcomes, focusing on decreased opioid misuse, increased patient safety, increasing chronic disease self-management, increasing quality of care transitions, and improving long-term care quality. Lake Superior Quinn's partners, which include MPRO, Metastar, and Stratus Health, would like to thank all of you for your hard work to advance the health and healthcare of your patients with us for the past five years. As we look to the future of improving quality on behalf of Medicare beneficiaries, our three organizations have entered into a new partnership called Superior Health Quality Alliance, or Superior Health, which is strengthened by the addition of the Illinois Health and Hospital Association, Michigan Health and Hospital Association, the Midwest Kidney Network, Minnesota Hospital Association, and Wisconsin Hospital Association. We have success driving achievement of Medicare Quality Improvement Program goals as either quality improvement organizations, the QIOs, or Hospital Improvement Innovation Networks, or the HINs, or the end-stage renal disease networks. Superior Health members currently improve health Illinois Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin, and have experience improving healthcare nationwide. So at this time, I'll move on to talk a little bit about the performance feedback reports, which came out last week in their final version. 
we'll talk a little, we'll talk a little bit about how to to access those who should get a feedback report. So to start out with, who should receive a 2018 feedback report? Individual clinicians participating in APM entities that that are not advanced APMs will receive MIPS feedback. You can log in to the, the portal and see those, and we'll talk about how to log in in just a minute. Qualifying APM participants or QPs and partial QPs who did not elect to participate in MIPS will not receive MIPS feedback reports. And the feedback reports are accessed through the QPP website, which is linked here. So that's that main qpp.cms.gov. So those clinicians who practice in multiple groups will receive feedback for each group they participated in or were, or were eligible to participate in. The score that will reflect and contribute to their payment adjustment is the highest score that they receive. Clinicians who participate in multiple MIPS APMs will receive a feedback for each APM entity as long as they were included on that participation list. And then those clinicians who voluntarily reported, so these would be clinicians who did not meet the, the low volume threshold or were not eligible clinicians but did submit data, they will receive feedback minus the payment adjustment. So there will not be a payment adjustment associated with their feedback report. So to access your performance feedback, you'll go to the QPP website. Again, it's linked here. And you'll need a what they call a HICUS HARP account. And HICUS stands for Health Quality Information System. And then the HARP is the access, access role and profile account. If in the past you have logged in, it's your same credentials that you, you had last year. The system has changed, but those credentials from last year should still work. And in some cases, you may have to reset your password, but when you log in, it does prompt you for what to do. If you need, if you've never been in there and need to sign up for the, an account, again, the instructions are on the website and you just follow the prompts on the website. The final score and what it's made up of or what you might see on the final score. The MIPS final score will be somewhere between zero and 100 points. Um, the payment adjustment is based on that MIPS final score. If you scored between 70 and 100 points, positive is subject to this, a scaling factor. So you will see uh, a payment adjustment in, in the case of somebody who scored 100 points, the adjustment for the base adjustment is 0.31% and the, they will also receive an exceptional bonus, which in the case of a score of 100 is 1.37. So the, the maximum payment adjustment for 2018 right now is 1.38. But I want to point out that last year there were, there were some updates to that as we went um, through this, even though it's final, it may not be the final final. So can watch for updates. Again, signing up for those updates from CMS will help you to be aware of that. Clinicians and groups that scored between, greater than 15, listed here as 15.01, to 69.99 points are going to see that positive MIPS payment adjustment. Again, it's subject to the scaling factor. And they weren't eligible for that exceptional performance. Remember, you had to score at least 70 points to get that. So they'll just see the positive payment adjustment. 15 points would give you a 0% payment adjustment or a neutral payment adjustment. If you received 3.76 to 14.99 points, you're going to see a negative MIPS payment adjustment that is greater than negative 0.5 and less than zero. 
in those that are received zero to 3.75 will be seeing a negative MIP payment adjustment of negative five. This information comes from the MIPS um, scoring 101 guide for 2018, um, which is linked at the bottom of this slide. So the quality category um, makes up, in most cases, for most clinicians, it makes up 50% of, of their final score. So what did, they, what did you have to do in 2018 to get to maximize your points? There were, you had to have six quality measures, and you, this was reported for 12-month period. That, in 2018, that was the first year where we had a 12-month um, period that had to be reported for quality. Clinicians could select from measure sets that were defined as specialty measure sets, and many of the clinicians had a, a measure set. If the measure set had more than six quality measures, you, you had to select six, including a high priority or outcome measure. If there were fewer, you submitted, you should have submitted your entire specialty measure set. And at that point, when you selected the entire um, specialty measure set, for, 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 for example, some um, specialists may only have had four um, quality measures in their specialty measure set, then the denominator, denominator changes from 60 to 40 to, for their measure. So you'll see some different things based on that in your report. And you submit six quality measures through a quali qualified clinical data registry as, as well. Some, some clinicians did register for the CMS web interface and reported in that way. Quality measures were scored against benchmarks when, when they, a benchmark was um, available. The, the benchmarks did differ based on your submission methods. And historical benchmarks for each of the submission um, mechanisms were based on actual PQRS performance data from 2016. Due to revisions in the CAPS for MIPS survey, the benchmarks were calculated based on 2018 performance data and um, are available for each of, of those measures. For a measure without a historical CMS, historical um, benchmark, CMS will try to calculate the benchmark following the submission period, which you'll see that. And the, those, can be, those performance measures can be calculated when the performance period benchmark, there's 20, I'm sorry, the per performance period benchmarks be calculated when um, 20 or more individuals um, for groups or groups submit the measures through the same mechanism. And they, they do have to have 20 cases on that and meet the 60% data completion. So when they're scored against a benchmark, measures can be re reliably scored against a benchmark if the volume of the cases submitted is sufficient. Again, that's greater than 20 cases for most measures. In the case of the readmission um, measure, that's 200. And then the data completeness requirement is 60% of the denominator that's eligible for, the, for that particular measure. So how are the points kind of divvied up for these measures? So it, you should have received between three to 10 category points for each of your measures. And beginning in 2018, you will earn one point for quality measures that do not meet the data completeness requirement. And that's for large practices. I, the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about small practices too. Um, the small practices, they, they had that floor at three points. So quality measure bonus points, 2018 was the first year that there was um, some improvement bonuses, but some of these bonuses are the same as 
as were um, dealt the first year too. So you earned for submitting additional outcomes, patient experience, or other high priority measures beyond the one that was, was required. So you would, should see two bonus points for each additional outcome and patient experience measure, and one bonus point for each for, each for other high priority measures. Bonus points are capped at 10% of the quality performance um, category denominator. And you, you could earn bonus points for using EHR, certified EHR technology and meet end to end electronic reporting. So th this year you do have, um, th you should see an improvement score. If, if you were eligible for one, there is no such thing as a negative improvement score, so only a positive improvement score. This was the first year for that in um, 2018. So MIPS eligible clinicians can earn up to 10 additional percentage points based on the rate of their improvement in the quality performance category. It is calculated at the category level. You do have to fully participate in this in the quality category to be eligible for that. And you also have to have um, sufficient data standards met. It is the improvement the score was calculated based by, comparison, uh, by comparing the achievements from the previous period to the current period. Uh, bonus points are not included in the improvement score. So if in 2017 you receive some bonus, or in 2018, it, those would not be included in the calculation of your, of the improvement score. The other, the next category to talk about is the cost performance category. To start with, I just wanna mention, if you just remind everyone that this category was weighted at 10% um, last year and you did not have to submit any data for this category. So individuals, groups, and virtual groups had to exceed the, the case minimum for the cost category to get scored. To determine the cost category score, CMS um, established a single national benchmark for each cost measure based on the performance period and compared that performance on each measure to benchmarks, assign, and then assigned a one to 10 achievement for the um, score measure based on the comparison. So CMS um, attributes the cost measures at the taxpayer ID or the 10 um, NPI level, and they assess it at the, in, assess at CMS at either the individual or group. So those of you who, it a group report will have the cost measure assessed at group level, and that's done by aggregating all of the individual um, scores for that group report. The attribution used to attribute beneficiaries for the cost differs between the two measures. So you'll wanna, there's information on the MIPS cost performance category fact sheet that talks about that attribution. They believe we did a, um, webinar a few months back on the cost performance category that talks a little bit about that attribution. Improvement activities, and as a reminder on these improvement activities, these were, are, were um, given a, a weighting of 15 MIPS points for, for 2018. So you could achieve up to 15 MIPS points for for maximizing this particular category. So in, um, improvement activities, th there were 40 points possible in this category. So if you received 40 points in this category, you would receive 15 MIPS points towards your, your, your final score. Um, they've, improvement activities have been assigned to two different categories and most of you are pretty well versed in that. They're the medium weighted and the high weighted categories of the improvement activities. High weighted activities earn twice as many points as medium weighted. So in this next slide, talk a little bit about those points. So 
generally speaking, for um, clinicians and groups, they receive the, the 10 points for a medium weighted, 20 points for a high weighted improvement activity. And so get to 40, there's a, couple, there's a few different ways to get to 40, obviously. You could have submitted two high weighted activities to get to 40. You could submit one high weighted activity and two medium weighted to get to 40 or four medium weighted act activities to get to 40 and achieve these 15 MIPS points. And the, the improvement activities are linked in this, um, there's, uh, there's some information about the activities here linked in this slide. There are some clinicians who get special scoring for the improvement activities, and in this case, they receive double points. So medium weighted activities get 20 points for the special scoring standards, and the high weighted will receive um, 40. So in that case, the, those clinicians eligible for special scoring, should they will only need it to submit one high weighted or two medium weighted activities to achieve full credit in this category. Now the last category to talk about today is the promoting interoperability. Now for, just as a reminder, and we've, we've had other webinars and they're on the YouTube channel about the promoting interoperability category. This is the old meaningful use, which um, became advancing care information in the 2017 and then in 2018. The, cate the category changed to promoting interoperability. And this category, you, you could achieve up to five MIPS points for. There were some clinicians who were eligible for reweighting of this category to the quality category automatically, and others may have, have submitted a exemption for this category. So in, in general, that for 2018, just real briefly, there, there were three scores that made up the promoting interoperability um, performance category. For 2018, the, anyone who met all of the base measures for promoting interoperability would have received 50% of the points available in this category. Or in other words, it would be 50 category points, which would give you um, 12 and a half MIPS points. In other words, performance score up to 90% in this um, particular category. But the scores were capped at 100. So if you've got 100% or 100 category points in this, in this category, the promoting interoperability, you would have received 25 MIPS points. In this, in this category. Again, this information was um, taken from the, the scoring guideline. With that, I, I'll open the phone lines, but I, I hope the presentation, along with some of the links, have helped you, will help you to interpret your performance feedback reports. If you, we have some time for questions, about half hour for questions. Lydia, can you remind people, uh, our participants, how to get into the queue to ask questions? Also, you may put questions in the chat. All right, so um, since we do have a different system, if you want to, like Mona said, go ahead and ask questions right in the chat. Otherwise, if you do want to ask your question out loud, just leave a note in the chat as well, letting us know so I can unmute your mic so you can ask a question. Um, right now, I'm just going to unmute the um, other backup teams' mics, um, Elena and Kim, so that they can answer your questions as well. So please use the chat um, to leave us a note that you would like to ask your question. Maybe start, Al Elena. Do we have any um, questions in the chat? I don't see any. No, nope, not yet. Okay. 
Thank you, Elena, for putting in all of the, the links and hopefully that's helpful for the participants. We do have one question um, from Randy. It says in many cases, or it's more of a statement, uh, in many cases the numbers don't add up to the score thought. And I think we did talk about that, right? Or I believe it, people would think it might be a rounding error there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Elena, um, so Elena, this is Candy. It sounds kind of echoey. So Mona, will you repeat what she's saying? Because I can't hear. Oh, absolutely. In many cases, numbers don't add up to the score. Do we have any thoughts on that? And Lydia, can you unmute Randy's line for us? That might be helpful. So what we, um, this is Candy, and what we did hear from Lisa yesterday, from Lisa Gall, was that their um, CMS, there are rounding issues that are contributing to that. That's all I know about that for right now. Okay. And I don't know if we have Randy's, Randy's line. Okay, Randy, you your me? line is unmuted. Yes. Um, it, in some cases, I, I get the rounding, you know, it might be just a hair off and I just attributed that to, okay, it's a little bit of a rounding error. In other cases, it's two or three points off. And so it's like, any way you look at that, that's, uh, that's hard to believe that that's any kind of a rounding error. So just kind of odd the way it works. Yeah. The, you know, you could certainly sub you could submit a question on that to to CMS, but Randy, I think what they're going to ask us to do is have you submit a targeted review. And I I know last year we talked about the targeted reviews as well. Yeah. I mean, but I don't know. This is just me my my opinion here. I don't know if it's right or wrong. I'll look to some of the other panelists to chime in. Last year, there was a little up and down with the scores when they first came out. It really wasn't until August till we, I guess what I would call the final final finally came out. So I don't know if you want to spend time doing the targeted review now or kind of wait until maybe they shake out a few things. Candy or Elena, any other suggestions, Candy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, even when they, even though they said they were final, final, um, they ended up um, making some adjustments a little bit later, but I would definitely do that targeted review. Mm -hmm. I have another question if I'm still muted. Yeah, you are. Um, you know, CM said that they, you know, they gave us original estimates of what the ranges were going to be. Well, those are... I hate to say a joke because they're nowhere near the uh, ranges oh, that they were originally <laughs> estimated. And so they, you know, have redefined, refined those uh, estimates all along. And, you know, this past year, it's like, well, it could be anywhere up 4%. We're like, all right, that's worth doing some work for. Um, and then, you know, we get our final scores and the top range is a small, I think 1.68, I, I look, because we did get yeah. a couple that had perfect scores. Is anybody in an uproar about that, or is it just kind of like, it is what it is, too bad? It, it'd be nice to, if people could maybe put their reflection of that into the chat too, but I, I suspect that people are disappointed because last year it was 1.77 and people were dis or whatever, well, I can't, maybe that wasn't 1.77. It, was, it was actually, it, Mona, it was actually one. And so, Carrie, there we go. So, I have two thoughts about this, and they're on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? On the one hand, after working so hard with organizations to get your best score and possibly get the best positive payment adjustment, I, I am very um, disappointed in how they actually turned out to be. And then the, on the other end of the spectrum, I have to be happy, I guess. Um, because that means that there were so many organizations that did so well that were able to share that $500 million exceptional care bonus that it ended up um, being so extremely small, even with the scaling factors. So 
completely opposite feelings on both ends of the spectrum about it, but I absolutely, I mean, I, from a provider perspective, honestly, that much work for 1.68%, wow. And I think even that some of the smaller practices are probably even more disappointed with it because of the resources it takes to report. Now, as we move forward, that floor, the, this, which was last year, the floor was 15 points to receive a neutral payment adjustment. This year, 30. That's going to continue to ramp up and eventually not be set by CMS. It will be set by the mean or median score. So at that point, I guess, potentially, those rates go up pretty significantly. Would be my prediction. And as the cost category becomes more heavily weighted. We have another question in the, yep. oh, well, another statement in the chat that says, consider the dollars associated with the adjustment when determining reporting slash improvement resources. Yep. So if, I, I don't know if it's still echoey, but I will reread that. It says, consider the dollars associated with the adjustments when determining reporting improvement resources. And this is Mona, and I, I, I have certainly had these discussions with the practices that it really is a cost-benefit analysis for a lot of um, practices to decide, you know, how much they need to report, what they want to report. And we do a lot of, re I have anyway, done a lot of reminding people up until now, and even this year, you can still probably get away with um, not reporting in every category and still at least receive a neutral payment adjustment. Now, for 2020, don't know if that will be the case. Any other questions or comments I, it, that people would like to share? Has anyone had any difficulty accessing their feedback report? If, you've, if you have, have not accessed your feedback report and need assistance, maybe type something into chat and we can contact you in the next week and help you out. I this is Jamie Betts. I work at Memorial Healthcare in Owasso. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Um, yes, I can. Um, we're, we're part of the Sparrow Care Network, and they're affiliated with Health. I tried to get on last year and um, obtain a HARP account, and I was told I couldn't because we belong to the ACO. So we didn't know of our performance, and we never even learned of our individual performance, it was the ACO's performance. So there's no feedback on how we performed and how we could improve. It's, it's quite disgusting because you put a lot of work into this and then you have no idea how one health system in this ACO performed. We didn't know how the oh, ACO okay. performed. Right, so it's, right. So it's hard to know if there's, it's, it's very hard. We just so, I attend these webinars to learn more, but I never know how we do. So Randy just typed CMS indicated they would be available on the website, but they are not. And we are told to go to the ACO. The ACO will not give us the scores. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I can't get them from Sparrow Care Network either because I don't think they provide them to Sparrow Care Network. Oh. Anybody, Andy or Elena, do you have any insights for this? No, because I, I think this is the same frustration that we've heard from last year as well that has not 
doesn't sound like it's been resolved. I asked, and I, I can last I, year there was 15, oh, go ahead. 15 measures from the ACO that they requested for Memorial to report. And actually they came in, uh, Primaris came in and extracted the medical records. There were 15 metrics. I, I've asked the ACO oh, several times last year what was going to be new for 2019, never heard back. So I'm just still doing the same 15 that I did in 2018. Yeah, that's crazy. That, that would be very, yeah, very frustrating There's a if you can't see how you huge lack of communication. You're... Yeah, I, I hear your webinars and I actually get confused because we don't do anything like this. You know, we just, right. be we belong to people. Pardon? Yeah, because most of our webinars have focused on the MIPS reporting because that was what we were, yeah. you know, yeah. mostly focusing on and directing folks to their, we've been told by CMS to direct folks to their ACO for more information oh. about their, their, their ACO. Now, I mean, we've done some webinars high Please. level on how an advanced APM works and how to join or, or whatever, but as every ACO is a little bit different, so it'd be really hard to do, to really get into the weeds on each one of them. So if, if Memorial Health has their own tax ID and MPI, even though I belong to an ACO, I still cannot get our performance off from the QPP website? Right, because that's, these feedback reports are MIPS feedback reports. So why can't I get our MIP? Why can't I get Memorial's MIP? Oh, because they submit it, ACO submits it to CMS from the ACO. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, you answered yeah. your own question. Yeah, I remember this last year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's been challenges. I wish we could help. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I just wish I knew what we measured on and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 all, all I can do is encourage you to just keep pressuring the ACO to try to get the information. Oh. Also, aren't, aren't the ACOs also required to uh, publicly report their their individual, not each individual pin score, but theirs? They do, but it means nothing to us because we're right. one little fish in the ocean. Right. You know, somebody verbally told us last year from the ACL, top 10%, but it doesn't mean anything to us. We want to know how we performed and how we can improve. But, yeah. 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 But, Wish we could help okay. more. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. In the chat, Don Wagner has a, a question. It says, the initial final score is on the website. When do you think the scaling factor will be finalized? Will CMS notify us when the final final scores are determined? If they follow suit of what they did last year, yes, Don, they will notify you of when the final final scores. Last year, what happened is they they gave notice that here's the final score, but there was one more revision even after that. Uh, so, all I can say is what happened last year. No crystal ball for this year. Does that help, Don? I hope. And I, again, I, I, I'll stress it again to sign up. If you haven't signed up for those email alerts right from the QPP website, Make sure you do that because that's where that information is going to come from. All right. Any other questions, comment or comments from the, the group? Elena just um, put the link in of where you sign up for the, that list for the quality payment program. 
and sign up for updates. Thank you, Elena. Here, Elena, do you have anything to add for today? I got it. I think we just want to thank everybody for uh, all the work that they put into the QPB program over the last several years working with us. So, they did a really great job. Yes, they sure did. And we are available through the the, the seventh of this month, if there's anything that we can help you with, we're, we're happy to help. And those of you that are at small practices, you still have the QPP service assistance available to you, to you. I'll just wait just a couple more minutes before we end to um, make sure there are no other questions that people have or comments. Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing any, any questions or comments at this time. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I, I would ask that you please take a moment to complete the brief evaluation that you're going to receive after this webinar. Um, it is in the chat right now if you want to click on that link to go to it. Also, it will be emailed to you shortly after this, this um, webinar concludes. And I'll turn it back over to Lydia. All right, thank you, Mona. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, the link for the evaluation is um, in the chat box right now, as Mona mentioned. And I will leave this meeting open for the next five minutes if you want to um, click through and take the survey now. Otherwise, you will receive an email later. So I will just have this um, meeting open for the next five minutes, and then um, that will conclude the webinar for today. Lydia. <laughs>